All right, let's go ahead and get started. We have been looking at the way that Christianity, by design, from the beginning, was never meant to be something that is just attached to our lives. It is something that is meant to be a part of everything that we do. I've used the example in sermons before of the fact that men like to be compartmentalized, that we all have boxes, if you will, of our life. So we have our work box. And when we get home from work, we, we take our work clothes off, we take the work box, we put it up, and we get our home box out. And some men get really super focused on their lawn, or some men get really super focused on a car. Or, but they have the thing that they do at home that that's that box. All men have an empty box. That's one of their favorite boxes where they sit and they just like to you know, be a hunter-gatherer with the remote, just flicking across channels, watching TV shows they're not interested in, kind of zoning out. Okay, so it's easy if we're not careful to just create a Christianity box that we have our work life, we have our home life, and we have our church life. But Jesus isn't interested in being one of the boxes. He doesn't want to be the biggest box. He doesn't want to be the prettiest box. He wants to own all your boxes. He wants you to sacrifice your boxes to Him, to give Him everything that you are. And Christianity is designed to be the way. It's the way we do everything. It's the way that we do our work life. It's the way we rear our children. It's the way we treat our spouse. It's the way that we live life. And so if I've established that principle, we need to move from the way to truths. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so I'm kind of letting that be our outline. There are truths that are just the way that things are, that God kind of lets us see behind the curtain a little bit so that we know how things are working. And the first one that I want us to look at is how we are put together. Mankind is, if you will, triparte. I know that's a fancy word, but you know what it means. Tri, three, parte, parts. We're, there are three parts to us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, God's word says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are made up of a soul, which is our emotions, our, our heart in the Old Testament, our body, which is the physical part, the gateways to the body are, are your senses, your sense of touch, smell, sight, hearing, and your spirit. The gateways of the spirit are reason, logic, thought. And so we are all three of these parts working together. Oftentimes when I've heard this described, people will say when they get to the idea of spirit, the thoughts, the mind, they'll say, that's who you really are. But I, I, that's not true. We're the sum of the whole. I can prove this. If you stay up all night long for some work project, some, something going on at school, and you pull an all-nighter, tell me the next day how your emotions work. Are you easily irritated? Are you, you easily annoyed when somebody pulls out in front of you? Physically, you're exhausted, and that bleeds over into, are you able to hold a thought very well? So it affects your emotions. It affects your, your ability to logically reason. All of those parts work together. They're all interdependent on each other in this life. They're all important the Bible says that at some point we will get a new body. Why? If to be absent from the body is to be present with God. When we die and we're in heaven and we're in the presence of our Savior, why do we need a body? I mean, throughout creation we see that there's a certain 
economy of creation. God doesn't make a bird with three wings just because a third one would be prettier. Everything that we have, everything and throughout all creation, there's a purpose behind it. There's a reason. There's an economy in creation. And the Bible says that in the second coming, we will retrieve our bodies. First Thessalonians, it says... For I would not have you ignorant, my brothers, about those who have gone before. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of the archangel. And those of us who are alive and remain, uh, are, uh, the dead in Christ will rise first. We get a new body. In the New Testament, and Paul in 2 Corinthians 13 talks about how Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. So there's something important about the body. We... Know, though, that the body is fallen. And I want you to understand that all of you is fallen. Your emotions are fallen. Your logic and reason is fallen. Now what I'm not saying is, uh, there's, a, there's a principle in Islam that says revelation trumps logic. That if something is revealed in Holy Scripture and it's contradicted by clear observation and thought, that revelation trumps logic. Well, the Bible never tells us that. In fact, I believe that um, real truth does not fear examination. And so the Bible makes logical sense. What I mean by saying that all of us has fallen is this. I have more than once had someone say, I'm going to leave my wife. I know I've been married to her for 20 years. We've had kids together. She hadn't cheated on me. She hadn't done anything. It's just, it's gotten, I don't love her anymore. And I've got this new girlfriend that I met at work, and everything seems to be uh, going along. I just love her so much, and I, I don't love my wife anymore. And I prayed a lot about this, and I've, I've studied the Bible, and um, God has given me peace. Whenever that sentence is uttered to me, I always have the same response. Do what you want to do. If you want to trade in mama for some young thing, do it. Do what you want to do. Don't use God as an excuse. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. God's word is not ambiguous in how, what you're supposed to do. So God is not the one giving you peace. You have convinced yourself. Your emotions will lie to you. The book of Judges is filled with some of the most horrific stories in the Bible. And it ends with, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Your logic, your emotions, your body will lie to you. Even on a, a basic level, we know that your body will lie to you. Uh, the Navy SEALs have done a study where they got some men who were obviously trained and in good shape to perform a physical task. To exhaustion. I believe it was curls, and so they're doing curls, and they do those curls until they say, the man says, I can't do another one. And from looking at oxygenization of the muscle, from looking at lactic acid levels, they were able to determine that there was only 60% utilization of that muscle. Your body lied. Your body said, you can't do anymore. And so the principle that we take from the fact that we're fallen is, is that we can't trust our body, our emotions, and our logic. They will all lie to you. And I'm here to tell you that 
in Christ, you own you. You've given yourself over to Jesus. You are a living sacrifice. Your body doesn't get to tell you what to do. You tell your body, enlightened by Scripture, what to do. Your emotions don't get to tell you what to do. You, through the renewal of the mind and God's Word, tell your emotions what they will do. And you can control your emotions. Let's just walk through each aspect of this. You have a soul. You have emotions. You have a heart. In Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. God put into man a soul. Animals don't have that. They are, at times, soulish. Uh, when my dog uh, chews up something that, that uh, they knew they weren't supposed to chew, chew up, I can look at them, they look guilty. But I know they don't have a soul. They just don't want to be punished. They don't want to be yelled at. They don't want to be in trouble. There's a difference between that behavior and your conscience telling you this is wrong. God gave man and mankind alone a soul. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, we have a really good picture into what that soul is. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Here, two men at this phase of their life, while they were going through hardship, God knitted their souls together so that emotionally, mentally, they were bound to each other. We all have had friends, we've had uh, spouses, we've had people in our lives that are more than just people we know. You know, the expression, blood is thicker than water, that we use to say um, that uh, family should be closer than friends, actually uh, is a contradiction of the original statement which was saying that a blood oath between two soldiers is thicker than water, which was the implication of birth. So it's saying that brothers in arms are closer than brothers who are just brothers by birth. There are times in your life where you'll have people that your soul is knitted together. And so that gives us an idea of what this soul is talking about. It's that inner longing, that inner part of you that's, that's emotions. And it, it is the part of you that makes you a big part of who you are. As we said in Jeremiah 17, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Deceitful is liar. Your heart will lie to you. The Lord searches the heart and tests the mind to give every man according to his way, according to the fruit of his deeds. Which tells us that sin first starts inwardly and then comes out. That's why Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man, but what comes out of him. Our heart will guide us to the wrong place. The worst, most uh, misleading statement we could say is follow your heart. Find your heart. No, don't follow your heart. You have a body. Your body has natural cravings. I mean, uh, anybody in here who went to college has seen uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, number one need on the, the chart is air. You need to be able to breathe. If you can't breathe, you will die. You have a physical need for that. No matter how much heart you have, if you can't breathe, you're going to stop doing whatever it is that you're doing. You have a need for food. You have a need for water. You have a need for sexual gratification. You have a need for um, rest and sleep. Our bodies have particular needs. Now, again, your body will lie to you about how important it is. 
I've often joked about how in our culture we use language that implies that we have needs we don't have need of. For example, oh my gosh, it's 12.30, I am starving. Well, you ate at 8 o'clock, it's only been four hours, you're not starving, you're just a little hungry. I need some ketchup. You ever been in McDonald's and you wanted some sauce or some ketchup? You're like, hey, I need some ketchup. We need ketchup. Well, you don't need ketchup. You want ketchup. And there's a difference there. So we need to be careful about the language that we use because your body will lie to you. A lot of military training, uh, Police training, training for uh, football is teaching people that their body can give them more than they think it can. In 1 Peter chapter 2, the Bible says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. When I am talking to men who are struggling with pornography, one of the things that I will say is pornography will rot your soul. It cuts you off from your ability to be delighted by the things of the Lord. Human trafficking, uh, the, the, the misuse of women, all of that thing, stuff is true. But in a purely hedonistic fashion, recognize that when you participate in that activity, that you are damaging your own soul. All of our passions begin inside and come outside through our body. When a person cheats on his wife, that sin doesn't start when he walks into the Motel 6. That sin starts way back when that man allowed his thoughts to go wherever he wanted them to go. You have a spirit. That's your thoughts and your mind. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul, talking about the spirit, says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? Now, what Paul here is saying is that in our spirit, our thoughts, our mind, the way that we think about things, that internal monologue that you have, who knows that? I read once that, uh, I think it's in Confucianism, it says that we're all three people. We're the person that we present to someone that we don't know. We're the person that we present to those that we know and love. And then we're the person that only we know. Your internal discussions, the way you think about things, the way that you talk to yourself about things. Only you know that. And that's what Paul is saying. For who knows a man's thoughts except the spirit of that man? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but he is to himself to be judged by no one. What Paul is saying here is that your spirit, if you are in Christ, has been recreated. Your body, your soul, your spirit in Christ are new. Now, your body, is, until glorification, is not going to be made new. Your soul is still a part of your fallen flesh. Your spirit, God is renewing day by day. God is working through you. And so, we need to expose ourselves to spiritual, biblical things. Now, to the natural man, these things are silly. Stop and think for a minute what we're asking the world to believe. We believe that 2,000 years ago, some guy we've never met, we don't know any of his family, we've, we've just heard of him, lived in a country most of us have never been to, 
He did things that are fantastic. He walked up to blind people and told them, hey, you, blind guy, see. Bam! And they saw. He walked up to people who from birth had a withered hand and said, hey, stretch out your hand. He stretches out his hand and bam, it's healed. He took a Lunchable and fed 5,000 people. So he lived a life that the natural order of things didn't work for him. He could do whatever he wanted to do. He was a, if you will, superhero. And then he was killed. And then he came back from the dead. That is a crazy story. We are asking people to believe foolishness. Dead people don't stop being dead. I've never had to worry at a funeral what the dead guy's opinion of what I was doing was because he doesn't care. And we're saying that this guy that we've never met, we don't know anything about other than what we've read and been told, stopped being dead of his own accord. And that his teachings from 2,000 years ago, we're going to follow and let it change the way we do things. To the natural man, that sounds stupid. They would say, look, I read Aesop's fables and I read about talking foxes. That doesn't make me think that 3,000 years ago in Greece there was some fox that talked. I understand that that's a fictitious story. I can read Superman comic books, and I don't assume that some guy really came here from Krypton. I can just read it for entertainment and maybe learn a lesson, maybe not, who cares? It's just for fun. You're going to actually believe that stuff? It seems silliness and foolishness, illogical, irresponsible. But to those of us who have been transformed, to those of us who have been changed by this person, Jesus, we would argue, but I do know him. And every time I pick up this ancient book, it changes me. In Romans 8, it kind of sums all this up and it says, but Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And Here Paul is cha- arguing that you can be changed. That yes, your spirit has fallen. Yes, your soul has fallen. Yes, you have a fallen body. But how? Which leads us to Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Your physical body is presented to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Here we have the body, we have the spirit. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. Here's how you transform your body. You daily die to what you want to do. You don't let your emotions tell you what to do. You don't let your mind tell you what to do. You don't let your body tell you what to do. You allow yourself to be animated by God's Word. Charles Spurgeon said, we should be a people who if we're pricked, we bleed the Bible. God's word renews us, rebuilds us, retrains our fallen soul. And that's our spiritual service. We allow it to affect what we eat, what we do, how we treat our body. And God's word is what dictates for us what we do, how we do it, so that we're transformed and our mind is renewed. And we learn through God's word what God's will is, and we do what is good and acceptable and perfect. 
Father God, I pray that we would look to your word. God, that we would be the people of the book. God, we would let your word dictate to us and for us how we should live. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the fact that you have chosen to give us special revelation. And you have chosen to reveal yourself in that word. Lord, I pray that we allow it to be our guardian, our taskmaster, and our balm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go serve your king.